Are we? <laughs> Hi everybody, it's Dan O'Connor. And today is a very special day. We are going to be doing tip number two. Oh, I think we're live now. <laughs> Hi everybody, it's Dan O'Connor. And today we're having a very special Valentine's Day episode. We are going to be talking about tip number two in five secrets to having a long lasting, healthy, loving relationship. Brought to you by Dan O'Connor and Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Hello. And Maggie and Buddy are here today. Maybe they could be joining us. We could let them in, maybe. Yeah. Open the door. Okay. Sure. And could we turn off the air, too? Sure. And today we're talking about one of my favorite things, being judgmental. Mom, I hope you're listening today. <laughs> not that she is. She's not. We want to talk about being judgmental this way. Yesterday was all about being selfish. Being selfish is going to be, when it, especially in the areas of I need to make time for me. I need to value me. I need to learn when to say no. Being judgmental is going to be dealing with topics like, for example, our spouse, girlfriend, boyfriend comes out and they're wearing an outfit that we don't think is the most flattering for them. Maybe they got their hair cut and we don't particularly like the way they cut their hair. <laughs> Maybe it's their family. We don't really like their family. Maybe it's their job, their, their educational level, their uh, sexual desires. We're not really in line with those, so we judge them. And when you talk about death by a thousand cuts, usually judgmental comments are about 500 of those thousand cuts. So what do we do when we need to deliver some feedback to our spouse? Because when we're at our best, most of us would probably agree that we would want feedback from our spouse or our boyfriend or girlfriend, significant other. We would want it. It's just that the way people deliver it sometimes make it, makes it difficult to accept, right? So how would you like to be one of the spouses or boyfriends or girlfriends or significant others or partners or whatever you want to call it that can deliver that feedback the right way so that not only are they open and ready to receive it, but they actually make a change or are more inclined to or the odds have increased that they will make that change. Here's how to do it. I'm going to talk about three specific areas that we like to sometimes judge or uh, criticize and we're going to talk about how to do it the right way in each one of them. So let's say that, let's say, <laughs> let's say that we're telling our spouse or our significant other when they're not working we think they could be a little bit more productive. We see them as a little bit lazy, okay? And let's say that we're talking about, or I'm gonna give you four. Let's say that we're talking about their friends and family and the things that we do and don't like about them. Let's say that we're talking about their appearance, things we do and don't like about that, and their sexual practices, okay? So I apologize, I just reviewed all four of those. When you're talking about somebody's let, let, excuse me. Let's start at the very beginning. When you're talking about somebody's work, when you're talking about somebody's habits, when they're not at work, you know, they're at home now. And let's say that you're a woman, you come home, your the man of the house of your house is sitting on the couch watching TV, and there's a bunch of you know dirty clothes in your bedroom. Let's say the lawn hasn't been cut. You still haven't balanced your checkbook, and you're thinking, well, that's nice that you have time to you know relax after a hard day's work. I had a hard day's work too, you know, if those types of thoughts are going through your head. Remember that we should tell people what we want them to do, who we want them to be. And when they do it, tell them how proud we are of them, especially when we're talking to men. We respond beautifully to the phrase, I am proud of you, or I am proud to be your wife. I am proud to be your girlfriend. I'm proud to be your husband. Whatever it may be, I am proud to be that person in your life. When you say that, we respond well to it. And when you say it because of this, that, and the other, remember that there's no real evidence that what we criticize or judge will diminish. You know, that's, there's, that's kind of a, we're 50-50, you know, in terms of the odds. But there's plenty of evidence that supports if we say to people what we really like and treasure and cherish about them and value about them, that they will do more of that if we say it in the right way. So I recommend, at, at the end I'm going to recommend specifically for women and for specifically for men, 
where should we be delivering this type of feedback? Should I be doing it in the bedroom, in bed? Should I be doing it as we brush our teeth in the morning? Should I do it the moment I come home and I find you? You know, in the offensive situation, <laughs> when should I do it and how should I do it is going to be critical because remember that the venue that we choose to deliver these messages along with the words is going to either open people up to the message or close them. So that's going to be a key. But remember that when we deliver the message, instead of telling people what we don't like about them, you know, how, how we see them lying on the couch, how we see them as lazy or whatever, instead, we're going to choose a moment and tell them how much we love it how proud we are of them when they do X, Y, Z. Okay, we can leave out the whole sitting on the couch thing because doing so will increase the odds that the next time we come home, they won't be on the couch. Number two, their appearance. <laughs> Instead of telling people what we do not like, you know, it becomes very easy once we're married for 10 years or you've been with somebody after the three year hump, you know, after you, the phenylethylamine has worn off and you get really into the day to day. Remember that relationships are just about us. The person that we are with in a long lasting relationship, you know, the person that we have chosen to be our spouse or our long term, our long termer, that person is there more than anything else to teach us about things that we have in us that we have not yet worked through those issues and the closer and closer that you get to somebody the more and more you're going to have to take a real cold hard look at yourself and all of those issues that start to come up are about you they're not about the other person they were fine when you first met and they're the same person but we start to project it onto the other person and say no no these are these are your issues these are your things that drive me nuts generally not they are our issues. They all are our issues. And it gets harder and harder to deal with them as that person that we have chosen brings us closer and closer to ourselves. That's what's difficult for us to take a real hard look at. And so many people will get rid of that person and move along to the next one where the drugs are still rushing and we can still hallucinate and see them for what they are not. So when you see something that you don't like, hair, dress, appearance, it's very easy for us to you know, make little jokes and say things like, huh, put on a couple pounds there, aren't you? There's no way, does not matter how good their ego is, it doesn't matter how beautiful you think they are, so they won't mind if you just point out a little bit of flab. There is no way to make a personal comment to somebody without negatively impacting your relationship with them. So remember that. There is no way to make a negative comment about somebody's appearance without negatively impacting your relationship. There's no way. And there's nothing that you can tell them that they don't already know. You telling them will just clue them into, they see it too. I'm no longer as good as I was in the past, as perfect as I was in the past. You don't ever want to make somebody feel that way. By the way, do we have anyone on, Andrew? Are you awake back there? Yeah. Well, we, yeah, we have a lot of people. They all say hi. Hi. Sammy Day says hi. Janet Gregg. Anybody from across the pond? Um, Jupiter is here. Hi, Jupiter. <laughs> and uh, did anybody have a question so far? Yes. Give me a question. Okay. Uh, Brenda Davis says, hello. How do I tell my long-term boyfriend that he needs to appreciate all that I do? That is a great question. How do I tell my long-term boyfriend that he needs to appreciate the things that I do. I'm going to get to that at the end, but please mark that down, Andrew, so that I do that, okay. so that I can keep going on track here. Any other questions that we have that go along here? So far, so good. So far, so good. Okay, then I'm going to move along to the kiss of death. There, there's a, a huge kiss of death. Oh, by the way, speaking of somebody's, <laughs> I, I missed, I skipped one. Speaking of somebody's friends and family, remember that in all of our relationships at work and at home, one of the most attractive qualities that we can have, and it's an easy one to get, is to speak well of other people when they're not around. If I compliment you and say nice things about you, that's great. I mean, let's just say that I get five likability points for saying, you know, I appreciate the way you treat other people and how kind you are and how compassionate you seem to be. That might get me five points. If, however, I'm talking to you and I say about Andrew, who's not in the room, if I were to say, I really appreciate Andrew's, <laughs> I really appreciate the way he treats other people with such kindness and compassion and 
you know, no matter who they are, he treats them as if they are equal or above him. He's a nice guy, and I, don't, I can't find enough nice guys in the world these days. If you say stuff like that about people who are not in the room, who aren't that, compared to the five points I get for saying nice things to you about you, all studies show that I'm going to get, <laughs> I'm making up these numbers, but I'm going to get 25 points in terms of my likability if I speak well of others when they are not there. Now, it doesn't talk about, you know, gossips or backstabbing. You know, some people do that, some people don't. But specifically, if I am the person who finds a nice thing to say about other people when they are not in the room, the reason, I believe, is because that person who you're talking to thinks you are a nice person because you are nice to that person when they're not even here. And even if you're not, you know, nice or not nice, you are a supportive, positive person. So not only are you that thing, I'm going to guess you say things like that about me when I'm not around. When I'm not around, so you win so many points for doing that. Judge their family and their friends in a positive way when you're with them, because they might not tell you. But if you speak poorly of somebody's friends and family, the only thing that is going to accomplish is it's going to reflect poorly on you. Don't make that mistake. I was going through a list. I have a video coming up. Make sure to watch it, by the way. It's coming out tonight. I'm going to do a live preview, and it's on five phrases, uh, the five top phrases to make people hate you. And you want to keep in mind, you know, that we should not be keeping score in relationships. You know, scorekeeping is a huge kiss of death. But we do have a tank full of <laughs> our uh, love for, the, for that person. There's a tank that we all have. Meaning, I need to draw from this tank in difficult moments with you. Therefore, you need to fill up my tank for those difficult moments. And it's all about trying to find this balance. You know, I want to fill up our relationship tank as much as I can because we are going to have some tough times where both of us are going to need to draw from that tank. And doing things like speaking well of other people's friends and hi, there's buddy, hey, hey, is going to fill up that tank. Hey, bud. Uh, Buddy and Maggie have been going kind of nuts these days because they found a vermin or a, a, a rat or something in the backyard. Hi, Megs. And yesterday, Maggie ate it because she's the mighty hunter. Hi, baby. And you could let's, let's, let's say hi to the dogs. Everybody wants to say hi. Hi, guys. Here at, where are they? Hey, Megs. Here she is. Hey, baby. And Buddy, you know, come here, Buddy. Come here. Everyone wants to say hi to you, baby. There you go. Hi, bud. Okay, so. <laughs> By the way, that's one of the reasons their relationship is so strong, is Buddy always speaks well of Maggie's family. You know, even though they're a little shady, you know, they're kind of, you know, it's, it's, they're different colors. You know, they're a very progressive couple in this world, and they take chances. So, you know, one of the things Buddy does is he tries to play the odds and speak well of her family, even when they're not around. The kiss of death. This is, the, this is the number four thing now, kiss of death. If you judge people or are critical of them in the bedroom, meaning if, if your partner, <laughs> if your partner tries something new, wears something new, suggests something new, and your reaction is to say, what? Oh, are you crazy? Or, oh, come on. Or to somehow laugh, whatever, diminish that. If you do that at all, you're doomed. And you're doomed especially because it takes a lot of guts for some people, most people, to bring up a secret that they have, a desire that they have, because that's revealing themselves. Whether it's to you or to anybody else, to reveal yourself is extremely difficult for almost everybody. Right, Andrew? Yeah. I mean, I have no idea who he is, but I know that it's very tough to reveal yourself and to, to, to stand naked or to lie naked with, no, Andrew does it with everybody, but to, to, to lie naked physically with somebody is very easy. You know, we, that, almost anyone can do that, but to be spiritually or <laughs> to be, that's it. To be really spiritually naked and to stand in front of somebody and let them know, to reveal yourself, this is who I am, this is me. To be that type of naked, that 
is difficult. And when you are greeted with any type of mocking or laughing or if the person who is supposed to be the safest person in the world for you pulls the rug out from under you and lets you know you're not that safe with me just so you know not that safe you lose on so many different levels because they will not only never go there again with you and try to reveal them reveal their desires or with you you have dramatically increased the odds that they will do that with somebody else. Because if somebody has a desire, a need, a want, it is an inevitability. Is that a word, Andrew? Yes. <laughs> it is inevitable that they will get that desire or need met. You want to increase the odds that it's with you. Also, you want to increase the odds that you will have that safe place to reveal anything that you need to reveal or would like to reveal about you. That safe place with your partner comes into play here with all of these four things, with judging people on their habits when they're you know not at work in their downtime, judging people on their family and friends, judging people on the way that they look, judging people on their desires and things like that. All of those areas should be safe and sacred when you are with your partner. Therefore, if you are going to <laughs> if you're going to go walk that road and you think, it's time I made some suggestions here, because we are open, most of us, to suggestions if they come the right way. So keep this in mind. If you are a man, this is the man and woman thing I was telling you about at the beginning. If you are a man, the best place for most men to speak to most women, and I know I generalize a lot here, but I'm just, I'm going to do it, is when you're sitting at the dinner table. Women, by nature, prefer to communicate face-to-face, -face, and they prefer to have your attention when you're communicating with them. One of the easiest places for us to deliver a difficult message that needs to be delivered, if, we are, if you're a man, is during dinner, because there we are sitting, generally facing that other person, but we still have a task involved. We're doing something that takes away from some of the nervous energy that we feel when we have to deliver a difficult message. So try during dinner, you know, between bites, bringing something up, you know, hey, sweetheart, you know, I wanted to say I really appreciate the way your mother helps out your dad. I think that's a beautiful quality in a couple. And I hope that when we're at that place in our relationship, we can do that for each other. You know, if you say that, you know, instead of, I'm really sick of you not helping me around the house and I need some help. If instead you talk about other people that are helping and you do it as you're sitting at dinner, you are golden and you will get more help if that's what you're looking for. If you are looking for your wife, for example, to wear more outfits like the one she wore on Tuesday, let's say that that's you know, the issue. You just you really want to give her that message. Instead of saying, <laughs> you know, she gets dressed for work on Wednesday, instead of saying something such as, you're going to wear that? You think people are going to take you seriously in that? Wait till you're eating dinner. Reach over, and this is a great tactic, by the way. Reach over and touch her on the top of the arm, you know, or touch her on the top of her hand. It could be, it could be as you're walking down the street, hold her hand. But I suggest the more sensitive the topic, the more I suggest touching somebody as you deliver it, because that's going to create a connection chemically. All sorts of chemicals get released in your body when you physically connect with somebody. So touch her and say something such as, for example, Sweetheart, I wanted to let you know because it just came back to me again how I was left speechless when I saw you going to work on Tuesday. I thought to myself, I bet everybody who sees her today is going to think just like I'm thinking, who is that and where has she been this whole time? I want to see more of her. I wanted to let you know that because sometimes when I look at you, I have to do a double take and say to myself, that's my wife? Whew, I'm the luckiest man ever. If you say it like that, you're going to get that outfit again. You know, if you say instead, oh, do you think people are going to take you seriously? She's going to start wearing that outfit more and more and more. And remember, it's all about playing the odds. If you want to increase the odds that you will get what you want, say it that way. Talk about, remember, what gets rewarded gets repeated. Give a reward in that person's language, you're more likely to get the behavior, the situation, the outfit repeated. Uh, when you're talking about 
when you're talking about, oh, when you're talking about the bedroom stuff, people's desires, what they want to do. You know, if you, if you want, if you want more of some behavior, if you're a woman talking to a man, I recommend same principles. You know, if you can touch him, touch him. Speak positive in positive uh, terms, not in negative terms. But the place that you want to do it more often than not, if you're wondering, how can I really, you know, pack all of the tactics together and increase the odds I'm going to get what I want by giving this criticism or judgment to my husband or my boyfriend or this man? It could be your your man and it's your husband. As you drive down the street in the car, when you drive down the street in the car with a man and just, oh, you know, by the way, there's something I wanted to mention to you. I really liked the blah, blah, blah. I really like the way your mom did this. I really liked your friend Joe the other night when he said that. I really appreciated this, uh, that, or the other. I really liked the way you looked in that outfit. Your hair looked so great. You know, what? last Thursday when we came home from the movies, I just wanted you to know I'm still thinking about that and it's now Tuesday in the afternoon. Let's do more of that. However you want to, or excuse me, whatever you want to talk about, do it in a positive way. Tell them you'd like more of that if it's the opposite of what you were going to judge. And then do it as you drive down the street because most men prefer to communicate side by side. That's how we like to communicate. And there's a whole lot going on there as you drive down the street to distract from the nervous energy. Many, many women and men who are married to men will tell you that they don't know why, but one of the best times to talk to them when they seem to really open up naturally is as they drive down the street. So if you're talking to a man, tell it to him as you drive down the street. If you're talking to a woman, say it to her over dinner because you're sitting in front of her. And remember in both cases, but it really works marvelously with women, make sure to touch them because creating that physical connection helps you create an emotional and communication connection. So with those tips, remember, uh, if you have a question, to leave it in the question section and uh, leave your Twitter handle. Andrew, are you awake? Are you awake? What's going on? Who's there? Who's there? Well, well, we have a lot of questions. Jupiter has a question. Hey, Jupiter, what's your question? I'm dating an alpha male. He doesn't open up to me, which I guard and appreciate. <laughs> I mean, he does open up to me, which I got and appreciate. Okay. I know it's hard for him. How do I encourage more of that? He doesn't want to look weak. I got it. Okay, so he doesn't want to look weak. I'm glad you said that because that is a big fear of most people. Um, first of all, remember that what is his, what's, the, what's his favorite thing that you could do for him? It's, it might sound silly. And like it's very basic, but it's true. People training is very similar to dog training. When you train dogs, one of the th one of the secrets to training dogs is I'll show you uh, is if you have not gotten one of these, get one. You can also use them to train people. Hold on. Um, oh, it was just here in my bag. Hold on, hold on, Andrew. What? Andrew hid my dog clicker. Hold on. Where is it? I know it's here. Okay, of course, the time I need it, I don't have it. But normally I have with me one of those dog clickers that you can get at uh, PetSmart. Have you seen that, Andrew, with a little squiggly, with a, yeah. you, you, do I have it? Is it sitting someplace uh, open? No. Okay, doesn't matter. There is a little clicker that you can get at, oh, oh, here we go. Okay. I'm not saying to do this with your boyfriend, Jupiter, but you can get these clickers at PetSmart for, I think, $1.50 or, you know, three bucks or whatever, and these are for dog training. The way that you, uh, there's, I'm getting to the point, Jupiter, I promise. The way that you use these with dogs is, if a dog does something that you want them to do more of, you have this in your hand during your training sessions and you immediately click it and then give them a treat. So, you know, if they sit when they're asked to sit, you click it, give them a treat. If you want them to stop barking, as soon as they stop barking, you click and give them a treat. Then what you do is you work into s simply clicking and not giving them a treat. But what happens is, and then you eventually stop clicking so you're not driving everyone else nuts. But the point is when they do something that's positive, that you want more of, you immediately click and then give them a treat because that will s send the message to them and they will quickly learn it. <gasps> I do that. I hear that click and I get a treat. So that 
ends up in a treat. And then we take the treats away <laughs> eventually because you can't give them treats for everything all the time. But they still are holding on to the, I, get a, I hear that click when I do that. I know that that's a good thing because I used to get the treat. Right? I, they're being a little stingy these days. But I know it's a good thing. And so they associate doing that with a good thing. And then eventually you don't need the click or the treat because dogs want to be good dogs. People want to be good people. And so I would uh, suggest when he does that, when he does that, when he reveals himself to you, when he opens himself up to you and you appreciate that, every single time he does it, even in the littlest way, give him the treat that he so much wants from you. You know, whether it's if he's a very tactile person, hold his hand and you know, snuggle up against him and kiss him, you know, right after, without saying, I love it when you do that, I love it when you open up, just do it. And he will eventually know, every time I do this, I get that. And if you keep doing that and keep reinforcing that behavior, along with, you, you know, you could talk to him about it, but it sounds like if he's an alpha, most, most men, we don't like talking about that stuff anyway, right? We don't, we don't, once, we have to admit or acknowledge or say, yes, I'm talking about feelings and, oh, I understand. This is a breakthrough for me. You know, you appreciate that we're going to stop. It's just it's such an uncomfortable moment. We will be associating that with doing that good thing and we'll be less likely to do it. So I recommend, which I bet you do, Jupiter, if I had to guess, every time he does it, don't make a big deal out of it. Give him the treat. Always, always, always. And then he'll keep doing it more and more. She said, thank you, and she tipped us. Hey, see Jupiter? Jupiter is the, the most beautiful <laughs> Jupiter. Thank you very much. It was, it was, it's always a pleasure seeing you. And uh, again, I'm still holding that rain check for one of our uh, bowl singing days together. <laughs> What's another question that we had, Andrew? Okay, so let me see. Oh, 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 uh -huh. excuse me. There was something I wanted to add to that, Jupiter. How he said he doesn't want to look weak. Okay. In some conversation, slip in. You can say you were listening to the nine principles. Remember, if you have not yet gotten the nine principles, I think people would really like them. And uh, they help you with any relationship challenge that you have. It's at DanOconnorTraining.com and you can get it free with your VIP membership. And principle number three, I think it is, is the opposite of weakness is not strength. You remember that? Have a conversation with them about this, you know, about how this concept that people are frequently worried about looking weak and therefore what they want to do is appear strong and they go around showing, I don't cry, I can take anything, I can stand up to anybody, you hit me, I hit you back twice harder, but strength is not the opposite of weakness. That's not what makes the planets go around the sun and that's not what makes a fetus turn into a baby or a caterpillar turn into a butterfly. What is the force that creates in the universe? What is the force that fuels creativity, Andrew? Love. Love. That is, I mean, you can call it God, you can call it whatever it is, but most people, I think, would agree of the con with the concept that that force, you know, the, the God particle that's holding all of the atoms and nuclear, nu <laughs> nuclei together, I'm going to call that love because that's what it appears to be when you really look at how it works. And that is the most powerful thing. That is the opposite of weakness. That is what creation is made of. Okay, so it looks like we got cut off. So everybody, please send a bunch of love to my internet provider here in Ajijic, Mexico, because the connection seemed to be a bit weak. <laughs> so send a lot of love my way and that ought to boost it right up. Uh, so is there any other questions that I should answer? Because I know it's, it's been a long time now, Andrew. I think, what time is it? It's been 30 minutes since we started. Yeah, let's, let's answer one more question and then we'll call. By the way, while Andrew's pulling up another question, remember, please oh. share, huh? Yeah, we're back. Oh, okay, we're back. Please share and like this. And if you don't like it, tell me why in the comments. And subscribe to this channel so that we can tell you when we're coming up live again and give you any new exciting news. Uh, but Please share these videos, especially because I think one of the things we're doing here at Dan O'Connor Training is we're trying to really unite, share, collaborate, so that those who are interested in being more mindful communicators can pull the global dialogue out of the
cosmic spiraling toilet swish that it's been spiraling down. And we can do that one conversation at a time together if we do that. So share this if you appreciate it. Yes, Andrew. Okay, Sophie's, Sophie's C. Hey, Sophie's. Says, moms are so hard. Moms are hard. Nothing works with them. Nothing works with them. Her, are you trying to judge me? She replies. Yes. Are you trying to judge me? <laughs> That's, it. That's it. What should I do? Okay, with your mother, here's what I recommend, Sophie, because it, it helps me air day. <laughs> when you are feeling like my mother is, she's out of control with her judging. She's out of control with her, you know, beating me down relentlessly type, you know, whatever that may be for you. Remember this. Think of what is missing from that relationship that you would want to insert or infuse it with if you could. Uh, like what is, if she has, if you have time to answer Sophie, what would that be? You know, what would it be that if you could, you would infuse that relationship with? What is the missing element that you wish your mother had more of when she was communicating with you so that you could enjoy your time with her more? Oh, so please answer that if you can. And here's why. Because when I, when I think about that, principle number, oh, I think it is six in nine principles is the only thing that could possibly be missing from this relationship, the only, the only possibility is the thing that I'm not giving to it. It's an impossibility that any relationship of mine could lack something that I could not be giving to it. I can't be looking to other people and I can't blame other people for it. This is my relationship. If there's something missing from it, it is up to me to infuse this relationship with it. So, having said, tell me if she replied. No. She hasn't replied? Well, no, I think since, well, no. no she okay, <laughs> because let's say, for, for everyone else who th thinks along these lines, let's say that I think, well, my mother could be, what's missing is more tolerance. She could be more loving. You know, she could be more patient. She could be more understanding. You know, maybe she should try those things. Once you've determined, and by the way, many times we do not know what is really missing. We think we know sometimes. We don't always know. But once we know, know with a capital K, that's it. This will always be true. Okay? So sometimes we believe that a relationship is missing something that it's not, that's not it. That's not what's going to cure miraculously this relationship. But once you've found it, and you can kind of feel it, you know, in your vagus nerve, once you've determined, that's it. You know, it's understanding. Once you've done that, then you know you need to be giving more of that to that relationship. For example, when I'm thinking about my mother, oh my God, you know, she is so judgmental and just relentless in her criticism. So what's she, what, what do I wish I could infuse this with? A little bit of understanding, a little bit of empathy, a little bit of kindness, a little bit of patience. Then I know Maybe I should start being a little bit more understanding and understanding that my mother is only worried about me, even when she's angry with me and she says things to me that are about me and offensive to me. That is because she cares about me and wants me to be safe and at peace. After she's dead, you know, she wants to make sure that while she's alive, she prepares for me for when she's dead. Maybe I could understand that a little bit more. Maybe I could be a little bit more patient and realize that there are things in my mother's life that I have no idea are going on. I have no idea about the struggles that she has to deal with, about her nights that she's up crying, about, about different things that have happened to her that she does not share with me. Why? Because she loves me so much and she wants to, hurt, to help me so much. She doesn't always know the right way to do it. And she makes mistakes because she's a human being. And I should be a little bit more patient and understanding and forgiving. Maybe that's about me and not about my mother. And I could be more grateful to her for being somebody that's actually there rather than many mothers who are off saying, I'm the queen of no and the queen of selfish and I'm going to go live my own life and screw my kids, they're adults. That's the mother I could have, but I don't. I have a relentless one <laughs> who, is, who is so worried about me that she would rather I hate her than, as, as long as I am prepared for life than to like her but not be prepared for life. Maybe I could understand that. And so what I'm saying is once we truly realize what's missing from the relationship, 
we've got it. That's the key. And you will realize, maybe I'm the one who could try infusing that. Because if you do that, problem solved. Because you will see that is it. You know, karma is not, you know, the whole yin and yang thing. Hey guys, I just wanted to let you know, I apologize. I'm signing off now. Buddy and Maggie have left. They said this is enough. Andrew, he's, he's, he checked out about an hour and a half ago. And it's time for all of us here to say goodbye. Thank you for joining us. And make sure to subscribe, like, comment, share, all that good stuff. And let's really pull the gl global dialogue out of the communication toilet, okay? So thank you. Is that Jupiter? Did she tip three times? No. Oh, <laughs> thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure being here. And for everyone here at Dan O'Connor Training, this is Dan O'Connor and Andrew signing off. We're going to try to fix the communication or the connection the next time. Goodbye.